Good morning. It's uh, good to see that you've been able to battle the metro chaos out there today. Um, it took me a bit to drive down. Um, and I apologize to my fellow panelists this morning. Uh, I was coming from a Senate uh, panel yesterday in Mexico City and flying through Atlanta. My last flight into DC got canceled and I had to sleep in Atlanta, so I was able to grab a flight early this morning, shower, change, and then make it on time. So I, I apologize for not being with you for the beginning of the program. But it's a, it's a huge pleasure and honor to be here today uh, joining my good friend, Senator John Cornyn of Texas. And I, I, I say this not because we're in Washington and everyone says, you know, my good friend, the esteemed or the honorable X or Y. Um, John Cornyn and I worked hand in hand for six years uh, during my tenure uh, as an ambassador to the United States. And this is no easy task. This is a complex, challenging relationship, as you've heard. No bilateral relationship the United States has with any country on the face of the earth has so many moving parts. And Texas obviously plays a central role in this bilateral relationship. I've always said that Texas has historically been the spark plug of the US-Mexico bilateral relationship. And John Cornyn and the former Senator of Texas, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, have played a unique role in pushing forward and modernizing and upgrading this bilateral relationship between both countries. And look, um, the senator and I sometimes disagreed on issues, as is obvious on a relationship uh, like the one that we have. But what always, always was the mark of the day was the ability to sit down, to discuss, based on facts, on facts, not on fiction, these days with a candidate out there who is Teflon coded to hard data, who's a walking fact-free zone, and whose facts are as loose as his lips, it is very gratifying that there are statesmen like Senator John Cornyn in the Senate today engaged in the day-to-day -day dynamics of what is probably one of the most important relationships for the security, the prosperity, and the future well-being of Texans and of Americans. So um, what we will do today is the senator will Address, we'll provide some opening remarks from the podium, then we'll sit down, have a bit of a chat, a conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So, Senator, so good to have you here with us today. Well, thanks, Mr. Ambassador. It's great to be with you and look forward to our conversation. Uh, let me express my gratitude to Brookings for hosting this, and it is very important. Uh, to have these sorts of informed discussions about policies affecting the United States and Mexico and our common border um, because we are dependent on one another in so many ways. Um, occasionally when I'm in Mexico or even in Texas, I'll talk about this being like a marriage. Um, we can't get a divorce. We've got to make it work. And it takes uh, people, uh, it takes uh, both of us, the United States and Mexico, working together and the truth is, for example, the United States uh, has about six million jobs that benefit from binational trade with Mexico. And so our prosperity depends in large part on the prosperity of Mexico and, uh, that, uh, and, our, and our relationship. So, and I, I might add, Texas and Mexico do have some history. Uh, you don't have to go that far back. I, the, the Senate seat I hold was first held by Sam Houston. Um, he came to the Senate in 1846 after Texas became a, uh, a state. Uh, but So we do have some history. I know you've had earlier panelists, uh, people like Beto O'Rourke and uh, Will Hurd, uh, speak to you. And it's great to see in a very polarized Washington, D.C., uh, the bipartisan cooperation and work uh, that we do together that I think really distinguishes the Texas delegation. Um, I work very closely with Henry Cuellar on many, many issues as well. So despite the partisan differences that seem to uh, be emblematic of what's happening in Washington and maybe in our politics in general, it's, I just want to reassure you that there are those of us who do believe that it's important to work together in a bipartisan, bicameral way and to work with our friends in Mexico and, in, of course, in the United States to improve our relationship because it is for our mutual benefit uh, that, we, that we do so. 
So there's trade obviously is, is a huge a huge component of that relationship and I'd just like to note a few things that have happened recently that I think are really landmarks in um, that developing, uh, that developing uh, issue to help uh, trade. The opening of the West Rail International Bridge, for example, last summer. This is the first new international bridge between the United States and Mexico in over a century, over a century. And then there's the launch of the pre-inspection pilot program at Laredo National Airport, the only place outside of Mexico City where international cargo bound for Mexico can be inspected. And of course, last month we celebrated the completion of the Tornillo Guadalupe land port of entry, now the largest border crossing along the entire southern border, and a testament to the hard work of leaders in El Paso, uh, El Paso County. These accomplishments would not have happened without leadership um, from, frankly, a lot of Texans that I'm very proud of. And again, on a bipartisan, bicameral uh, basis. And because we do have a front row seat in what happens along the border, we have a, obviously a very much of a vested interest. But this isn't just about, uh, as, I'm, as I hope to impress upon you, the border is not just a local issue. It's not just an issue between Texas and, and, uh, and Mexico or Arizona, New Mexico, California. These are everybody's issues because the, the prosperity, as I said earlier, of our two countries, uh, benefits uh, both of us. We did, for example, pass legislation that is very important to our to the infrastructure issue. And no, Mr. Ambassador, it's not about the wall. Uh, I am talking about a long-term transportation bill, uh, the first time in a decade. Uh, this legislation provides state and uh, city leaders the certainty needed to address our long-term transportation challenges. And if you go to the border, let's say in Laredo, where it's the largest uh, land port of entry in, uh, in the United States, you'll see a lot of trucks stacked up there. Not good for commerce, not good for the environment, uh, not good for trade. Um, and so infrastructure is important. We've also uh, been able to engage in some public-private partnerships that allow the cities and communities, local governments there to contribute uh, to efforts, whether it's staffing or whether it's other infrastructure development to help facilitate uh, those cross-border issues. I know this group knows how important quality infrastructure is. Uh, one report recently found that $116 million in U.S. economic output is lost every minute a truck sits idle at the border, $116 million U.S. dollars. And in Texas, that border infrastructure moves about $100 billion dollars of exports to Mexico each year alone. And of course, quality infrastructure is also important because our border crossings are the first line of defense against bad actors who want to exploit those borders. And we also know that uh, it's not just about the United States and Mexico. What happens south of Mexico also has a big impact on the United States. And of course, I'm referring to the unaccompanied minor children coming in from uh, Central America which um, has been called, and I think appropriately so, a humanitarian crisis. And uh, this is, um, unfortunately, you know, as I reflect on what's happening in, in, uh, in Central America and my visits to uh, there, I guess about a year ago now, I was in Honduras and uh, San Pedro Sula, and uh, I think we could say the most dangerous neighborhood and the most dangerous city and the most dangerous country in the world. And people ask, well, why would somebody, why would a mother put her young boy or young daughter, uh, turn them over into the hands of a, a criminal organization that would uh, offer to transport them from their home in Central America to the United States? What must life be like in Honduras, for example, or in Central America that you would risk that? Well, it must be pretty bad. And so it's part of our national interest, too, I think, to help our friends in Central America as well as we did in the omnibus appropriation bill that passed last December to help them build their society out so people can stay uh, home, uh, which I think is uh, something common to all of us. Our desire to grow up and to prosper where we, where we, where we live, where we were born. Last Congress, we, um, I, along with Henry Cuellar, introduced something called the Humane Act, 
relative to this uh, humanitarian crisis of children from Central America that would help us do a better job protecting them once they got here in the United States. It's tragic, I believe, that the children who make it safely into our country are sometimes placed into bad circumstances through a lack of adequate vetting by the sponsors of the people who they're placed with while they're awaiting their immigration court proceedings or uh, what have you. The Humane Act would require all potential sponsors of these children to undergo a rigorous biometric background and criminal history check and would add another essential layer of protection. We can, of course, do more with our friends uh, in Central America to stem the tide of unaccompanied minors, and I know Mexico has done a lot as well. Uh, but once these children arrive in the United States, it's my conviction that they are our responsibility to help keep them safe. And I look forward to reintroducing that uh, legislation soon. One final example I'll mention is the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. Um, many of you are aware that in the New England and, uh, and diverse parts of the United States, there's an opioid prescription drug abuse problem that's resulted in overdoses and people becoming addicted to the prescription drugs. When those aren't available, uh, they will then convert to heroin. Um, and again, I know the, the challenge is for the United States and Mexico is, of course, the United States is the demand side of this, as my Mexican friends point out. And it would make life easier in Mexico, particularly dealing with the cartels and the criminal organizations that profit from the illegal drug trade if the United States was able to do more on the demand side. And they're absolutely right. But in 2014 alone, drug cartels smuggled more than 250,000 pounds of heroin across the border at a street value of about $25 billion. It's big, big business. And while production has been growing uh, to meet the U.S. demand, unfortunately, U.S. efforts to interdict those drugs have fallen short. So listening to uh, some of our law enforcement personnel and also our military, uh, people who, like the recently retired uh, General Kelly, who is head of uh, Southern Command, um, we need to put more assets in the hands of law enforcement uh, and our military to tr try to make sure that we help our friends in Mexico and elsewhere interdict these drugs uh, before they get to the United States. Well, I could go on and on, but I won't. The point is that there are many avenues to work toward a stronger binational and bilateral relationship and a more prosperous uh, future for both the United States and our friends in Mexico. And that's because in the 21st century, securing our border is more than about just immigration. It encompasses everything from humanitarian disasters to terrorist threats. And I'm hopeful we can continue to work together and keep our heads about us while there are some who appear to be losing theirs uh, in the process. Because it is in our mutual national interest to make our border safer and more economically vibrant. And as I said, the truth is our success in the United States depends in significant part upon Mexico's success. And when we're both prospering, the communities along the border do too. So Mr. Ambassador, thank you for uh, having me here in Brookings, and I look forward to our continued conversation. I should have added that uh, last March when I was in Mexico City, Mr. Ambassador, I was with uh, Senator Tim Kaine from Virginia and the Chamber of Commerce sponsored a breakfast and had uh, all of these U.S. US oil and gas companies uh, meeting in, in Mexico City to try to learn more about the uh, change in Mexican approach to um, energy. international and private investment in, in the huge energy resources in Mexico. So as Mexico can, develops its energy resources with the aid of more private investment and, uh, of course, under the auspices of, of domestic law, uh, I think there's a great opportunity for economic growth and jobs and greater prosperity. So I was encouraged to see that. As, as I mentioned, uh, as I threw out there, the idea of Texas being a spark plug in the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship, <clears throat> and when you look at the 
landscape of structural reform in Mexico today, mm. there's clearly no issue that could become a renewed driver of engagement between Texas and Mexico than obviously the energy reform. Obviously, the international prices of oil have not helped Mexico deliver upon some of the potential and the promise of uh, structural reforms. There will be a, a very important milestone uh, on its way as we head into uh, the latter part of the year when the Mexican government announces the uh, tender process for the deep water uh, deposits, which is where I think a lot of the private, potential private investment uh, attraction and interest and appetite will be. Mm -hmm. and that will be a very important moment, and obviously a lot of Texan uh, uh, firms and corporations or headquartered in Texas will play a very important role. But yes, that, that is one issue that I think can sort of galvanize uh, this uh, strategic relationship that has uh, occurred historically between Texas and, and, and Mexico, despite Sam Houston and the Alamo. Um, I, I was going to spare you uh, the you know, issues of the world, but as I heard you throw it out there, I, I, I was, I'm biting my lips and I'm just going to say that the, the only place where we actually do need a wall is around Trump Tower on Fifth Avenue with Trump inside. Um, but it, it, there's a saying in, in this city that you know very well, which is that you know, politics stops at the water at water's edge. But in the case of the Texas-Mexico relationship, it's not the Atlantic, it's not the Pacific, it's actually the Rio Grande. But it speaks profoundly as to why Texas, with both Republican and Democratic governors, and Richards and George W. Bush has played such an important role as a leader in driving the direction, the traction of this bilateral relationship. But somehow, and I may be wrong, I haven't been, in, 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 I haven't been traveling to Texas as often as I did when I was the ambassador, but something tells me that we've, we may have lost a bit and the rhetoric and the narrative that has been triggered by particularly one of the contenders in the GOP today, has sort of set back some of, the, some of the perceptions of how our citizens understand this bilateral relationship. Um, how, how do we, in this context, sort of ensure that we can continue to win the hearts and minds of, of, of this huge trans-border community, which is in and of itself a, a reality that most in Washington, D.C. And, and, and Mexico City don't get and don't understand? Well, 38% roughly of my constituents in Texas are Hispanic, and of course, um, many of them have family on both sides of the border, or certainly came from um, south of the border, so. Or the, or the border crossed them in, in after 1847. Well, we, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I said, we have history. But the point is that uh, this is all, th these are, folks that, uh, in our communities that we go to our schools, that uh, we go to church with. I mean, this is just that we work alongside, and so this is not uh, dealing with some other um, group or um, this, these are my fellow Texans. And so um, I think part of, as you know, part of my background is, is, uh, comes from uh, law enforcement as Attorney General of Texas and a judge for 13 years. So I have very strong uh, conviction that the rule of law is very, very important. And I think part of what you see is the, the reaction, uh, particularly in the context of the border and immigration generally, is a sense that we've kind of, the United States has lost its way when it comes to the rule of law. And, um, and I think once people have the confidence that, okay, we have the law, we have the rules, and the rules will be observed, and people who don't play by the rules will be uh, held accountable, then I think we can begin to restore public's confidence in it. Because the United States is the most generous country in the world when it comes to our immigration policy. We naturalize almost a million people a year, including a lot of people from, from, um, from Mexico. So, um, but I think as long as people are feeling insecure, uh, either in their person or in their job, and they have the sense that, well, the rules that used to apply no longer apply, and they're looking around to say, well, who can I hold accountable for reestablishing some order out of this chaos? I think you get a situation like we have now. However, one could argue that there are, in my view at least, there are two pivotal moments uh, in the recent history of Mexico and the United States 
that have profoundly changed the dynamics of the U.S.-Mexico bilateral relationship. And Michael, I, I, I apologize, but I, I don't agree with the perception that the U.S.-Mexico agenda was an auto automatic pilot before 2013. I disagree vehemently with that, with that perception. But um, not, not, the first one was NAFTA, which, as you mentioned, profoundly changed the way both countries um, engage with one another economically and in terms of our joint supply and production platforms. And therefore, when Mr. Trump talks about you know, putting um, uh, duties and tariffs on, on US exports, he forgets that 42 cents of every one dollar of Mexican exports is US content. So it's an own goal that he's scoring against US businesses and US manufacturing. But NAFTA was a very profound shift in the way Mexico and the United States engaged. But the second one, which a lot of people still haven't sort of processed, is 9-11. Mm -hmm. Because after 9-11, Mexico and the United States started working in a way which, despite the challenges of a border like the one that we share, despite the real issues and dangers that exist because of the topographic, geographic nature of our border, Mexico and the United States have been working hand in hand to ensure that potential terrorists, particularly, don't use our common border to undermine the security of the United States. And in many ways, um, even though this may not be very popular to say in Mexico, the U uh, Mexico has been watching the U.S.'s back since 9-11 when it comes to international terrorists. How, how, how do we convey... Uh, one of the things that I always fought with as an ambassador was how do we inject these changes and this data and this narrative into two, we've got loonies on our side too. Um, they run in the best of families. Um, but how, how do we use the bully pulpit to talk about how profoundly this relationship has changed? And that doesn't mean that everything is peachy and rosy. There are issues, there are challenges. There are many things that need to be improved on both sides of the border. You've mentioned the perceptions of uh, insecurity or an issue that Michael mentioned uh, which in my view is probably one of the most persistent challenges to Mexico's image in the United States, which is endemic corruption and impunity prevalent in Mexico. This doesn't mean that we have a peachy and rosy world, but there is a profound change that has been occurring in the bilateral relationship over the past 20 years. H how do you sort of, how do you go to your state and to the districts that you go to and tell people about this profound change that has occurred without people saying, you know, this is, this is crap. <laughs> well, some of them will say that. I know. Uh, or some I, I, them, or I some, heard it on the road for six years, believe me. Or some, some won't listen, but there are, I like to think there are enough people who will listen that you can't give up trying to, uh, to provide facts and a reason, a reasoned argument. But I would say, Mexico and the United States have, have worked very closely together on, on, uh, on uh, terrorism and uh, on uh, security issues. I know this is a little bit, we don't talk about some of this because frankly, I know Mexico gets a little sensitive when they see their neighbors to the north sort of uh, exerting themselves and obviously there's a lot of pride and a lot of history and, and, um, and the, uh, Mexico's entitled to make decisions within its borders as a sovereign nation and not without regard to what the United States may, may think. But the fact of the matter is there has been a lot of work and a lot of cooperation there. On the trade part, I think, you know, this is a, kind of a mystery to me because NAFTA is not a dirty word in Texas. People view it as a benefit uh, and that we are the number one uh, exporting state in the country, which is a reason why we continue to add jobs, one reason we continue to add jobs. And a lot of that's with, of course, between our, our two countries. So that's one reason I've been an, an advocate of Trade Promotion Authority and now the Trans-Pacific Partnership which will soon come over to the, um, to the Senate. Um, that's going to be a challenge in this political environment. Yeah. It may mean that, uh, that, uh, that it does not get uh, taken up uh, before the election. But that's one reason why I fought for the, trans, the, the uh, Trade Promotion Authority, because it's a six-year authorization. Um, and uh, we need to do this deal, because uh, obviously China is going to set the rules in Asia if we don't, and I see this as something that will benefit uh, both of our, our countries. But we have to also admit, I think, that the benefits of trade don't fall evenly. 
-hmm. and the, and the, because there are some places, I'll just say, for example, the textile industries in, uh, in uh, South Carolina and, and elsewhere, yeah. when you opened up uh, places in Central America and elsewhere that could do it cheaper and more efficiently, well, those jobs went there. That causes dislocation, which is real and which we need to pay attention to, which is right. We had um, the Trade Assistance Authority, which provided additional benefits and job training for people who did lose jobs as a result of the movement of their industry to some place that could operate more efficiently. So um, I just think we need to keep trying and we need to keep banging the drum. We keep, uh, uh, we don't give up trying to provide those facts and those reasoned explanations. Talking, and I've been given the five minute mark, so I'll, I'll be very brief and try and see if we can squeeze in a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, talking about the issue of winning hearts and minds, you, you've been a voice of reason in getting a U.S. ambassador to Mexico confirmed, uh, Roberta Jacobson, who is uh, uniquely qualified to be the United States ambassador to, to Mexico. Um, the problem is that many in Mexico don't understand how Washington works, don't understand the politics of how nominations uh, uh, work their way through the Senate. And the perception generally in Mexico is that because we're now five months and counting without a U.S. ambassador there, that the U.S. has no skin in the game. Um, can, can you share with us uh, your uh, perceptions as to how this process, especially after what happened last night, uh, may move forward in the coming weeks? Yes, yeah, certainly. The, uh, this isn't about Mexico. This is about Cuba. And uh, Ms. Jacobson's work there on behalf of the administration. Um, to be honest, I've talked to uh, Senator Menendez, for example, from uh, New Jersey, who's not excited about the nomination, and, and he's been one of the ones that's put a hold on it. My understanding, he's now changed his, his uh, perspective. He'll allow a vote, um, and certainly uh, I intend to reach out to Senator Rubio, who I think is the other person who has a hold on the nomination. Uh, we are working, trying to work with them and with the White House to try to bring Ms. Jacobson's nomination up for a vote. I agree with you that our relationship is simply too important to leave that position uh, vacant uh, any longer. And, uh, but it, that's been our challenge. So we are working on it. There is a bipartisan uh, effort working with the White House to try to get that vote. And I believe if the vote is held, she will be confirmed. And mind you, I'm not putting you on the spot. I'll be an equal opportunity cheerleader here. It took us six months to designate ours, so, so we're, <laughs> we're more or less on level, on a level playing field. But uh, are there any questions from the, from the audience? Yes. And could you please sort of provide us with your name and uh, affiliation if there's one? Hi, I'm Paula. I'm a George Washington student, and I'm from Texas. And my question is with regards to illegal uh, dr uh, gun trafficking. So what's going on from the U.S. to Mexico? want to know, um, given the whole rise in advocacy for more gun, tra or gun, more gun rights in uh, Texas, how will this affect the illegal drug, uh, gun trafficking back mm -hmm. to Mexico, Central America, Colombia, and so on? Well, obviously, the United States and Mexico have very different views about private ownership of, of, uh, of guns. We have a constitutional amendment. We have a lot of debates between ourselves uh, here about the scope of reg appropriate regulation of, uh, of gun ownership and rights. But we are united in our efforts to block as many of the, those guns coming, particularly from straw purchasers, through, uh, uh, through our ports of entry uh, south. Uh, this is a huge problem. Those guns don't just come from uh, the United States. They come from around the world as well. And uh, I know this has been a subject we've talked about a lot over, the, over time. And I just think we, we come from very different uh, perspectives given the constitutional uh, protections in, under our laws and just a very different point of view that we just have to continue to try to work with and manage. But clearly we are united in our desire and our efforts to try to prevent those guns coming from uh, particularly straw purchasers uh, back into Mexico. One reason I was particularly outraged by the uh, Fast and Furious um, initiative by the uh, uh, Justice Department uh, and why I pushed so hard to get answers is I think, you know, this was just a, a, a dumb idea um, to allow these purchases to take place and then to try to hope to catch up with them at some point and then um, um, and to, uh, to get the larger network. But 
I don't know, Mr. Ambassador, what's your, you probably have a, like I said, a different point of view, but um, I, I do believe we are united in our desire to keep those guns from going uh, south. Oh, but I'll just very quickly say that again, as, as in most things in the US-Mexico bilateral relationship, you need two to tango. And whereas we have put pressure obviously on the United States to curtail uh, uh, the flow of guns and to shut down some of the loopholes that allow guns to be illegally purchased in the United States and illegally cross uh, over a border. I always said as an ambassador that uh, despite what I may feel about gun rights in the United States, it's not my role to challenge uh, the Constitution or the sovereign rights of the American people. What I, what I would say is that I am convinced that the Founding Fathers didn't draft the Second Amendment to allow guns to be illicitly bought in the United States and illicitly trafficked over an international border, and that's what we've been asking the US government to do. But Mexico also has a responsibility in how it modernizes its customs uh, uh, agency so that it no longer is just a revenue uh, uh, agency, but it becomes a law enforcement agency that can stop those guns from crossing into Mexican territory also. But uh, we have time for one last question. Yes. Yeah, Chris. And just identify yourself. Yeah, Chris Wilson from the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center. I, you mentioned the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, as an important you know, sort of step forward in the trade architecture for the Americas, for the Pacific, with Mexico and Canada, our, our biggest trading partners. I wonder if you could just walk us through your sort of legislative outlook for when we might see a vote on that. Are we still sort of headed towards a, perhaps a lame duck vote, or, or what's your outlook for the... Well, I, I wouldn't anticipate a vote before the election. Uh, let me just put it that way, particularly when you have the leading candidates of both political parties very negative on the whole trade uh, idea. There also are, um, which I happen to disagree with, but that's, uh, that's just, uh, just th that there, that's the political environment we're in. I think um, there are some specific issues that are, are problematic, even for those of us who voted for trade promotion authority, particularly the, the uh, shortened protection for uh, patents. For in the biologics area, there were some areas that uh, that are particularly uh, disturbing to some regions of the of the country, like uh, our friends in North Carolina on the tobacco issue, and you have things like that are sector specific in the ag sector, like uh, dairy, and and the like, which are always challenges in these trade deals. It's amazing to me that any trade deal is ever done, uh, <laughs> given the complexity of these. But we have done it; we can do it. And I think we should continue to uh, work our way through this and, and get this one done. Uh, there are some who just simply you will never convince. Uh, but I think uh, there's a very good argument. And in fact, we don't have, you don't have to just tell people to trust us. Um, you can show them uh, the impact it's made on a region and on a country. On a countries. And uh, I just think that it would be a terrible shame for us not to pursue the Trans-Pacific Partnership because you're going to default uh, the rules to China. And um, I think we have a very uh, big national interest to make sure that doesn't happen. With that, please uh, join me in thanking a true statesman and a true friend of the Mexico U.S. <laughs>